Hello, Internet friends, and welcome back to another episode of Go Ask Alice, the show where we jump down random internet rabbit holes and bring you wonderful factoids from our adventures in Wiki Wonderland. I'm Drew, and I spend far too much time on YouTube. With me is... Uh, I'm Lindsay, and I look like I listen to Bjork. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lindsay. Uh, I'm Sarah, and I have a pet rock named Eugene, and he sits atop my computer and has done so for the last seven years. That sounds like a booby trap. <laughs> <laughs> He's Eugene the Ukraine, right? Anyone who knows geology might know what type of rock he is. It rhymes with Eugene, um, but he's got googly eyes and everything. We'll put a we'll put photo on the Twitter. <laughs> wow. I love that. Wow. wow, you got a wow. You got rock. Wow. Yeah, you can't be a scientist unless you have your pet rock. Oh, that's my problem. Well, I guess I fail. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is the show where we jump down random internet rabbit holes, like Drew said, by starting out on the same Wikipedia page and clicking around until we find something that is so interesting we cannot stop reading it. This week we stepped, stepped, oh my, this week we started on a uh, potato, a little random XD. <laughs> <laughs> um, holds up spoon <laughs> it's spork hey <laughs> um, where did you guys end up <laughs> dear god bury this Drew where did you end up uh, I ended up on life support systems oh my god Yes. <laughs> I was like, bury this, like kill it. And you're like, I ended up on life support. Okay, life support. <laughs> okay, that's very cool. I just finished reading a book all about like a life support system for an alien, which is pretty neat. That sounds pretty neat. You had to phrase mm. that so carefully, Drew, because I know you were going to say I ended up on life support. <laughs> <laughs> It's not funny. <laughs> it's not funny. Uh. Oh, it's what life feels like sometimes, though. So. Oh, man. <laughs> Where did you end up, Lindsay? I ended up on a book this time. I feel like I'm you this week. I ended Ooh. up... Yeah, you're turning into me. <laughs> it is a medieval book called <laughs> The Discovery of Witchcraft. <gasps> oh, oh I already love it. <laughs> where, where are you, Sarah? <laughs> uh, I also ended up in ancient type of, of history, um, but it might be the most ancient history of the New World, and it's called The Sacred City of Coral Soup, and it is in Peru, and it's just Ooh, pretty awesome that sounds extremely mysterious and interesting it does but before we dive in we have question of the week um which is always the most fun because we get to hear not only our answers to each other but we get to hear your answers online too um so this week's question <laughs> i think this is a drew special if i'm not wrong <laughs> yes it is um yes <laughs> it is if you could make any one movie what would it be so i'm gonna throw to Lindsay first this this week so i'll say that when drew originally posed this question i think it was something along the lines of like everyone has to take you seriously and this absolutely has to be made <laughs> um, <laughs> like you go into universal or warner brothers and you, you just pitch the idea you're like this is it yes but i have like my sims cheat codes where everything goes the way that i wanted yeah. to go <laughs> Yes, Rosebud. Yeah. Rosebud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, or Motherload, if you're, yes. <laughs> um, if you're tired of clicking. Um, <laughs> I really want an in-depth history of toilets. <laughs> <laughs> I love toilets. I'm not kidding. Like, I really thought about this and I was like, I want someone to like really like, I want to know. I want to know the history of toilets. Yeah, like even even before like civilization, like when we were like homo sapiens, like what did we do about poop? We, we are homo sapiens. Okay, well like that when that's all we were. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> I don't know what you mean by that. <laughs> Like back before we, like when we were still very much yeah, wanderers. Yeah. Yes. Like nomads. Well, there's a whole field of archaeology that looks at fecal excrement from both humans and, and animals 
to try figure out exactly what they ate and and their diets and their health. Maybe that's the type of research you should be. Yeah, like if somebody said that to me as like a young child, I would have been like, that's my direct, like, bye, like, figure it out. That's my direction. <laughs> See ya, that's where I'm going. <laughs> well, now I'm here. I'd watch that movie a thousand percent. If anyone wants to fund it, please contact Lindsay. <laughs> I have ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Opening night is going to be amazing. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> what about you, Sarah? I thought about this, and it could either be like a really serious type of Carl Sagan vibes. Why the fuck are we here? Like, why are we here? What is existence? Is it pain? Probably. Um, you know, type of art housey. <laughs> um, but... I don't know, I'd probably get lost in my head making that. So I think my ideal movie would be like The Secret Life of Snails because I really, really like snails. Uh. I love them. I love seeing them when it rains. And I want to know, like, where do they go when it's not raining? Like, what is their little life like? You know, how long do they have their babies <laughs> near them for? And, and hunting and gathering of a snail. I just, yeah, I want to have a little itty bitty film crew and follow some snails around. That is adorable. Thank you. <laughs> and Drew, can you top the secret life of toilets and snails? So I have I have two answers to this question. I my first answer is a silly answer in that I would just get a movie of children falling over because I find that the funniest thing in the world. Oh no! Just like. <laughs> Isn't that just funniest home video? <laughs> no. Kind of, but just like, it would just be like an hour and a half of just children falling over. Because <laughs> they just fall. Wait, but can they be, <laughs> can they be dressed up like, like Charlie Chaplin? <laughs> 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 Little silent film babies toppling over. <laughs> Little silent film. And there's like a piano in the background. Like, <laughs> <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i would love to see that just like children falling over to piano it would be so because they, they fall and they just like for no reason they just fall they just, over they topple <laughs> they do they're still getting their earth legs <laughs> oh my god so that's that's my funny answer and then oh i thought that was the serious no that's me too <laughs> You thought that was the serious answer? Yes. No, no. My my serious answer, on a much more somber note, mm-hmm. um, is I would actually make a documentary on the um, the backlog of sexual assault kits and wh- like how that happened <gasps> and why that yes. happened, and kind of get an idea, like spread the word that there's this huge backlog of them, and also kind of you know bring people's attention to it, but also maybe help support you know getting them tested so that at some point you know people can find some justice because that's what i do but you know it's um that's kind of what i would do as a documentary yeah that. that that would be fascinating i um last year i think i donated to a, i can't remember what the charity name was but they were trying to raise enough money to clear um cold cases of um like rape kits from murder victims that were Jane Doe's yep. to try to figure out if they could mm-hmm. identify at least the perpetrator. Maybe they could identify the victims. Um, but it is, it's fascinating how many wow. are just literally sitting on ice waiting. Okay. For I have never heard of this. This is like an issue that's completely new to me. Can you give me like a brief like synopsis of like the issue? So basically what would happen is people would get, they'd get these sexual assault kits collected and then, instead of processing them they just kind of get put into a warehouse and just kind of left there and so there's all these sexual assault kits from the 80s and 90s and (gasps) 2000s where it's just they're just sitting there they're just they're and evidence goes bad pretty quickly and can you know it can have things grow on it and all kinds of horrible things that you don't want to have you know happen to evidence is happening right now to this evidence because it's just sitting in like a, a a warehouse somewhere and so Basically, what my documentary would be about is, you know, why this happened, how it happened, and like a way to prevent it in the future kind of a thing. That's actually a great idea. I think it'd be super cool. I think it'd be super important. Yeah. I love that one. I'm glad that you went last because if I said history of toilets after that, I would have. <laughs> yeah. Me and Lindsay just look like idiots now. 
<laughs> no, <laughs> I mean, I said children falling over for an hour, so. <laughs> Ah, uh, so good. Well, you're a good person, Drew. Oh, I appreciate that. So, what order should we choose this Let's time? Let's start out. Maybe we can start out on life support and then raise ourselves from from the dead and go back in time. Okay. Uh, so I'm excited to hear about this. Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> I am morbidly excited. Me too. Me too. Before I begin, it took me about seven clicks, I think. From potato? Was, yeah, seven clicks yeah. to get to life support. How'd you get there from potato? <laughs> we're, we're both just incredulous that it took seven clicks but go between life support and potato. So From potato. So I went from potato <laughs> to deep fryer, to from deep support. fryer to um, oh. airlock, from airlock to submarines, um, sorry, airlock to... To spaceships, to submarines, to um, life support. Interesting. So clicks, wow, that is that's so much quicker than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. What? <laughs> it, it didn't take long. All right. Yeah. I'm kind of intrigued how submarines <laughs> went right to life support, but because life support. So so okay. Let's start out by defining what life support actually is. So a life support system is a is a combination of equipment that allows for survi- that allows for survival in an environment or situation that would not support life in its absence. Mm-hmm. So this is a, like a super vague definition to me. I'm just like, what the heck could it possibly mean? Um, but life support systems or LSSs um, keep you alive when you would otherwise die. But if you really think about it, a life support system can be can apply to a lot of things, even medical technology with this definition. So I think it's fitting. Mm. So uh, generally life support systems are applied to um, space and underwater. So when you think about spacecraft, you think you have to have a life support system. When you think about underwater, you also have to have a life support system. But as I mentioned before, you know, medical situations also use life support systems. So it's kind of a, a very nebulous subject. And I focused more on the life support for space and underwater and not so much life support for medical uh, oh. situations because that was... Uh, because that was a little more interesting yeah. to me. Yeah, you know? space life support I think is fascinating, especially when I don't know if you if you dove into like radiation shielding and things like that. Once you leave the Van Allen belts, and just trying to like yeah. not mutate the shit out of our body is very difficult. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's um, that's definitely one of the major things that that is like an issue with space flight is radiation. Um, So specifically in human spaceflight, the life support system is grouped into what's called an ECLSS or Environmental Control and Life Support System. So I'm just going to call it ECLSS (laughs) or ECHLS uh, for short. Eccles. (laughs) Eccles. So um, ECHLS, uh, they supply air, water, and food, as well as maintain the correct temperature, acceptable pressure, and deal with the body's waste products. You know, pee pee poo. Okay, that's in the future (laughs) section of... (laughs) Pee pee poo poo. <laughs> pee pee poo poo of the um, future. <laughs> so we're definitely talking about pee pee poo poo. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so the <laughs> the Eccles must also shield against harmful external environmental occurrences such as radiation or micrometeors, which I thought was very cute. Little micrometeors coming and flying and ruining your day. Um, so, oh, can I, we do a fun aside on micrometeors? So yes, go ahead. If you, yeah, so if you have a microscope at home um, or if you work in a lab and have access to a microscope, if you're a real adult like, like us, um, you can go outside and basically just take a sample of like dirt or dust from the ground, from like some concrete. And if you look in it, you will see uh, most likely these very tiny little spherical um they look like little bits of metal and they're little metallic uh, bits of rock, lots of iron and things like that. And they are micrometeorites that travel through our atmosphere. And we get something stupid like thousands of tons a year of these tiny, tiny, no way. yeah, tiny little like heavy metal micrometeorite particles that are just landing on the earth. Um, and you can't see them because they burn up so tiny um but they're they're really really cool and you can see them under a microscope and they're they're really really cool i have no idea yeah so every time you're outside you're probably getting hit that is fascinating base debris and you don't even know it or better yet people i don't like are getting bonked all the time by space (laughs) 
moon. <laughs> a space debris. Yeah, bonked. that's how we want to see it. You're getting bonked. <laughs> bonked by space debris. <laughs> the forbidden bonk. <laughs> Why is it forbidden? <laughs> Because polite society does not bonk. <laughs> does, not... does not bonk in public. Oh, no. oh my God. Back to life support. <laughs> yes. Sorry, Drew. Sorry for wrecking your segment. No, it's fine. All right. In underwater diving, um, life support um, is considered, the, the equipment that you use when you're, when you're diving is considered a, a life support. It's not a full system. It's just a... a equipment but um saturation diving systems that's considered a full life support system because the the difference is when you dive with like regular breathing apparatus that's just like you're actually still exposed to the environment but with a saturation diving system you're like you actually have an environment around you that is uh protects you from the outside so it's it's a little bit different than than just like a regular diving suit uh which i found super interesting so it's like you got a little buffer around you that, uh-huh. that you dive with. To like prevent you from pressure, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, this also applies to submarines uh, where breathable gas uh, requires treatment to remain re- respirable. And the occupants are isolated from the outside ambient pressure and temperature. So most modern submarines generate oxygen through electrolysis of water. They use a device called an electrolytic oxygen generator. And the atmosphere control equipment also includes a CO2 scrubber, which uses amine gas treatment to remove carbon dioxide from the air and diffuse it into pumped out waste. So you're literally pumping out crap and CO2, which is really cool. <laughs> that is really, really cool. I had no idea that happened. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's how they get rid of CO2 is that it gets scrubbed from the air and then gets pumped out overboard. That's real. Yeah, I never thought of that. I literally, I, I don't know why I always thought that it was just recycled. Like, I didn't think that it was tossed out. Yeah. Um, in, in space, it's a little bit more recycled, but in, well, it's, it kind of, um, it is also tossed out, but it's, it's a little bit more balanced while in, um, under the, under the sea, under the sea, you can, <laughs> sorry, you can, you can uh, be a little bit more liberal with your, with your pumping overboard. Um, mm. So uh, fresh water is produced uh, by an evaporator or reverse osmosis unit, and even submarines have their own Eccles. So I just found that very interesting. And then when we get to medical life support... Uh, this includes the heart-lung machines, medical ventilators, and dialysis equipment. So uh, the term life support kind of extends to a lot of very different things. So what I wanted to get into, which I found super interesting, is the metabolic needs of, an, of a human and how a life support system has to like interact with that. Oh, yeah. A crew member of average size requires 5 kilograms or 11 pounds of food, water, and oxygen per day to perform standard activities on space missions. That's a lot of freaking weight. Holy moly. That's a lot of weight. No, and I was just going to say that these, these levels, of course, vary depending on the person and the amount that, that their activity or how active they are. Um, but, you know, this is a lot of mass that we have to, that we have to deal with, you know, because you're bringing it up and you're taking it back down. So, um, and also with, when it comes to water usage, uh, the, it tends to be a lot higher than just the pure biological needs because we have to, you know, we have to shower, we have to clean things. So there's a large amount of water that's used as well. So this just has to be taken into account um, by the ECLS, the ECLSS. Um, it needs to, it needs to be able to recycle this, or it needs to be able to address it in some way. And also, we need to think about sending it up into space. You know, the storage of supplies for space flight. You know, it's it's a lot of weight you have to have you know, packed away just of water, just of food. And it's, it's a lot to consider. Right. Like we always think about fuel, but it's like each yeah. human um, really requires a Needs lot. a lot of fuel. <laughs> yeah. We're pretty high maintenance. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we're very high maintenance when it comes to like being an animal. Like some animals can, you know, exist, live in their best life on very little, like water bears. They're basically happy everywhere as long as they've got yeah. some water. They're pretty, pretty happy boys. But it's like, I don't know, it's interesting to me that some animals evolved uh, to, to really be so self-sufficient, like even in terms of what they need from nature. And it, it, 
Like, I don't know why we, who are comparatively so weak, uh, you know, deserved thumbs, but here we are. <laughs> we didn't deserve them, but we got them. <laughs> we got them. All right. So let's talk about the atmosphere and how that's maintained by the Eccles. So a space Eccles maintains atmosphere composed what? of a minimum of oxygen, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. That's just at a minimum. Um, and the partial pressures of each gas combine to make an overall barometric pressure of the system. So um, like we observed with Apollo 1, the elimination of non-oxygen gases um, in the internal atmosphere can greatly increase the risk of fire, which is a terrible thing in space, um, <laughs> especially, <laughs> especially for just ground operations, but also in space, fire is not a good thing. Um, and so if you just have pure oxygen, it's a huge fire risk. So um, that's why a lot of space, uh, a lot of modern spacecraft use nitrogen and oxygen filled atmosphere, like our, our actual atmosphere, because um, pure oxygen can also be toxic at high levels for long periods of time. Yeah, you go a little bit wee woo in the brain. Go a little, yeah, <laughs> you do go a little <laughs> woo in the brain. <laughs> Um, but what's interesting is the, the, uh, space suits that they use to, you know, go outside, go outside <laughs> in space, uh, <laughs> that actually just uses pure oxygen. Really? Um, because yeah, because it's, it's for such a short time that the, the oxygen toxicity is not a problem and the suit has to be flexible. So you can't inflate it too much. And the lowest inf inflation pressure, um, can be achieved through oxygen and not nitrogen and oxygen. So spacesuits use just pure oxygen, which I found very interesting. I never knew that. Yeah, it's why there can be um, uh, like a, a greater risk of fire um, within like electrical components of a spacesuit because if you have all that oxygen, there's a lot there's a lot that can combust and that is not good. Yeah, a battery overheats and, and you're in trouble. You're getting cooked alive. So that's mm. that's not good. Um, yeah. Yeah, we don't have like our spacesuits, our EVA, so the the ones that are designed to go outside for a longer period of time. There's not that many of them. Um, you might remember last year there was meant to be like an all female um, spacewalk, but they couldn't do it because the two women who were meant to go didn't fit in different sized suits. They needed the same size, so they have like small, medium, large, um, and then they have, um, you know, slightly different. Uh, extremities like your hand and your feet cups that go on but the actual suit itself you just kind of have to fit and whether it's if it's too small it's dangerous and then if it's too big it's also just as dangerous because you can't maneuver correctly um but yeah so if you don't fit in your your small medium or your large that's it you you don't go outside you don't go outside <laughs> that sucks <laughs> it really does and they're super expensive to make i'm um, sure i'm sure they are yeah and we don't even have ones that are really up to scratch for going back to the moon so once you get a, a, away from the the protection of our magnetic uh our uh, magnetosphere around the earth that, that protects us from most of the high energy particles um you're kind of up shit's creek without a paddle because our spacesuits are like the technology from the 50s and the 60s and so they've spent so much money trying to develop the next generation of spacesuit and it still isn't ready yet which is just wild because it's so complicated that, that i feel like applies wow. to so much because a lot of what i saw in this this life support was just like it's coming but it's not quite there yet so i just i find that very interesting she's a coming she's a coming um, but also interesting, the wiki article included a list of specific space vehicles and space stations and their associated atmospheres. So like it gave specifics to what they had in their atmosphere specifically. And, um, yeah. that I just found interesting is that they, they had that kind of, uh, that was just in the wiki article. So that was kind of cute. Um, so let's move on to, to food and water. So, uh, water is used for, of course, drinking and cleaning. Um, but it is used for thermal control as well and for emergency uses as well. So, um, you know, if a fire breaks out, you have to have water to put it out. So water must be stored, used, and reclaimed efficiently mm. since there's no quote-unquote on-site resources. You know, you're, you're not out in space and just like, oh, I can find water here. Right. Um, but <laughs> in, the f yeah. in, in the future, uh, lunar missions could probably draw from the, the polar ice 
or missions on Mars could use water in the atmosphere or ice deposits. But as we said, we're not quite there yet. And, um, but we're, we're getting closer. We're getting closer, definitely. Um, and food must also be supplied as to date, there have been no missions that have cultivated their own food out in space, which I found very interesting. Um, so life support systems could include plant cultivation systems in the future, which would allow for food to be grown on the ship. However, no such system has flown in space yet because the logistics and space requirements have not been addressed in a feasible way. And it would be great to grow our own food in space uh, as human waste could be used as fertilizers and plants would naturally regenerate oxygen. But as, as I said, we're not quite there yet either. But there is definitely hope. Um, so there's experimental life support systems called Melissa and Cybliss, um, which are currently being developed. Melissa's evil twin. <laughs> Melissa's evil twin. <laughs> so uh, Melissa stands for Microecological Life Support System Alternative, which contains a combination of both microorganisms and higher plants in an ecosystem that could potentially produce self-regenerating life support systems for long, long-term long space missions. So it's got these little tiny microorganisms that can produce oxygen and has higher plants that can actually um, also produce oxygen, but also be, you know, a, uh, a, a food source. Um, and Cybliss is cyanobacteria-based life support system, uh, which directly processes available resources on Mars um, into useful products or substrates for other key organisms and um, is a form of bioregenerative life support system or BLSS. BLSS. Um, and basically the system would make a manned Mars outpost almost completely independent of Earth by quote unquote living off the land uh, to reduce mission mm -hmm. costs and increase safety. So you're not having to worry about like, oh my God, are we going to get the next shipment from Earth? It's like we're producing our own, you know, uh, on the planet. Um, so the combination of these two systems could make the process of living on Mars much more feasible instead of solely relying on a closed loop system uh, with supplies from Earth. So instead of just purely right. using everything that Earth gives you, you're able to generate your own, which is a super cool thing to do. And um, yeah, so the future, it looks like we're aiming to live off the land instead of trying to carry everything we need with us to other planets, which I think is super cool. And I always wondered about life support systems and kind of how they worked. And now I know quite a bit more. So, yeah, that's a little bit about life support systems. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool, Drew. Yeah. I, I love the idea of living off the land yeah. on Mars. Like, yeah. you can imagine someone setting up, like, a Mars ranch. <laughs> with some Mars potatoes. <laughs> Mars potatoes. You know, we go back <laughs> to our original topic, Mars potatoes. <laughs> yeah, Mars potatoes. Well, the Martian. Yeah, exactly. And that was that he pretty much did what you know used his poo poos yes and some dirt and some microorganisms to keep the soil healthy yep uh, that that was such a good book and scientifically pretty accurate I like it yeah that's that's the future right is there is that the is that the future you'd want to live in though if if someone took you to Mars and said yep cool you can live here but you've got to grow your own potatoes if I was given the option to have a one way trip to Mars I would take it one hundred percent of the time. Really? Really? A hundred percent. I, you know, by Earth, I want to live on Mars. Like, I want to be one of the first Martians. Oh my God, I could not disagree more. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <gasps> I'm so fucking scared of space. Me, me too. I mean, I would go, but I'd want a return ticket and like um, a spa day booked on Earth when I return. <laughs> <laughs> you return. Yeah. <laughs> You know what's interesting though is like completely independent to to this because obviously I didn't know what you were going to talk about. I went down a very similar rabbit hole like on my own time uh, a few days ago because I've been watching um, like live cams of deep sea. They're like off the coast of Florida. They are currently measuring yeah. the like topology of some of the ocean floor, and I've been watching the deep sea cams because I am fascinated by the ocean floor completely and um they had gone about a thousand meters down and i was interested to know uh what that would feel like on the human body and it would feel like a hundred atmospheres it would on top of you be an awful time like you're yeah without protective suiting like everything would just that's, so that's so 
Right. That is, that is the rabbit hole that I went down was, um, different types of suits that you would need if a human wanted to go that far underwater and like where the record is. And I think that the, I think divers in general try their hardest to get to 300 meters, but a lot of people die. And, uh, I found out that actually the Guinness book of world records removed that record from the book because too many people were dying, trying trying to achieve it. Wow. Yeah, and what's incredibly interesting is that noble gases like helium become toxic under those high pressures because what's happening is your body is being forced to accept the gas. And so it's being pressed into your organs and and such like that. So you have to take different cocktails of oxygen or different cocktails of um, gas down with you depending how far down you go. Yeah, and I don't know if you've ever looked into like the really, really deep sea, uh, like professional divers that work on fixing like internet cables and intercontinental, you know, oil pipings and things like that. And they'd live at pressure for whatever their their time is on duty. So they live at pressure in the in the vessels or in the ships, and then so they can go down uh, at that really, really high pressure, um, like being able to accept. the the gases that they need to survive before coming up. And there's this documentary on one of these divers that had his oxygen disconnected um, as he was going down. I know, Uh. like, absolute nightmare. Technically, he should have died because he was down there way longer than, like, a human could conceivably survive on the surface without oxygen, especially to your organs and to your brain. Um, and but they they went down to rescue him, thinking it would be um, like a recovery, like a body recovery mission, basically. But he survived, and you know, no brain damage, no no internal organ damage, no, nothing sufficient anyway. He was able to make a full recovery, and he went back to to doing that job. Wow, which is yeah, he, went he back? still does it. But they think it was something to do with like such such high pressure and the way that the gases. Um, yeah interact very differently with our tissues at that that high pressure that kept his organs and his brain um like fed enough with oxygen to survive that long period of time isn't wow. that but like emotionally i would have never gone back oh me too never ever um <laughs> but what a legend Drew, thank you for this. This was really, really cool. Yeah, this is really cool. It's now time for some totally real ads. Has anyone ever told you that you're just not good enough, that you can't achieve your goals? Well, I'm here to tell you that you can. You're never going to accomplish what you plan to do. So why try? My solution is just give up. You know, lay on the ground. Stop caring. Just let life pass you by. Give up. That's my life plan. And that's my life goal. So, fuck. Cool. So maybe there were just some ads. But... (laughs) (laughs) Who's gonna... (laughs) Who's to say? Maybe you (laughs) skipped to this point by chance. Um... But good news, because you are coming upon the discovery of witchcraft, Oh, which is, that is the book. That is the book that I landed on, Um, taking a page out of Sarah's book, which I wish I chose a different phrase, because now that's just confusing. (laughs) Um, Book and book. Book book and book. The uh, the actual spelling of this is Old English. So if you were to read it very literally, it would be the discovery of witchcraft. <laughs> oh, I love Old English so much. So good. It's got that like weird F that means S. And oh, love that double V's. Sort of before w. before S's were cool. Yes. It, ah, very very interesting already. That's my hook. Uh, and. What year did you say this was? Medieval. I didn't say what year. So it was 1584. Oh, that they were the good old times. You had some witches. You had a debate over whether Earth was the center of the universe. Turns out I it's actually not. would 1584 actually be Renaissance. I'd meant to say I don't, I don't know. know. I mean, I think that is look. actually Renaissance. While you're looking, um, I will introduce the book's author. 
Uh, his name is Reginald Scott. He was an Englishman. And uh, he decided to put this book together because he was fed up by street charlatans. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I keep getting tricked. No. <laughs> he's so he's sick of he's sick of kids on his lawn, basically. Yeah, he was like, yeah. everyone's having too much fun in Renaissance medieval times, and I'm gonna fuck it up. It is the Elizabethan slash Tudor period. Uh, 1584. Yeah, Queen Elizabeth the was from 1558 to 1603. Her reign. Ah, uh, that's. Glad you said that because with the succession of James the first in 1603, it's it is widely held that every copy of this book was burned. Ah, oh, really? But good news for you. A good good old book well, burning. So the reason that people wanted to burn it was because um Scott, believe it or not, so even though he's writing this book to be like I'm going to, he's basically like Mythbusters, but for for the 1500s, Mythbusters might be a really dated reference at this point. <laughs> I'm like, no, Wait, I don't it? know, but oh my God. I, now I'm thinking about it, but I, okay. It was my childhood. Basically, this guy was like, these are illusions, Michael, and, and I'm going to prove it. And he writes them all down. (laughs) But despite being such a killjoy, he actually is making the point throughout the book that the prosecution of accused witchcraft is non-Christian and irrational. So you should not be persecuting witches. And if you do, you're a shitty person. And of course, the the Roman church hated that message uh, because they were like, how dare you defy like our... um, I guess, superiority or authority on the subject. And um, that was when James the first uh, ordered that they, they all be be burned. But uh, I found a PDF copy of this on project Gutenberg. So thank you, project Gutenberg. Um, So some, some copies, I guess, or editions actually did survive. So some of what we're going to do, we're going to play a little bit of like a imagination game. I'm going to like walk you through an illusion um, or a few of them straight from the book. And uh, it was a hilarious exercise because everything is spelled very phonetically because language hasn't been standardized. So it's just one of those where like... I'm like saying it out loud and understanding it. But as I'm reading it in my head, I have no idea what this is saying. (laughs) Um, But I wanted to, to give a little bit of more of an overview of the impact of this book. So the discovery of witchcraft was um, meant to be uh, like a helpful document, actually, um, but because it was probably one of the earliest documentations of witchcraft or illusion. So I think that there's an important distinction that has to be made. So when I'm saying witchcraft, um, I'm using their term. But if we were to put it in today's terms, I would actually be talking about like magic tricks and illusions. Um, because back in, the, okay, yeah. in those days, um, mm-hmm. the planets... And like uh, alchemy and astrology, that sort of like genre of what we may call magic today, um, to them that was science. Like to them that was actually just real. So there was no debunking the heavenly like influences on rocks and stuff like that. Like I am, I'm pretty sure some people still believe that that is is still real. Like. Like some people full on believe in your star chart and your your moon alignment, right? Which don't get me wrong, I love a good horoscope reading, right, right, right. But it's not not scientific. I, so I'm, but it is fun. I think what I'm trying to say is that from a from a historical perspective, the the distinction be- between it's not like it's not like the Salem witch trials where it was just like she's a witch it was they were doing some form of magic no so what I, what i'm trying to say is that uh in this period of time what they're calling witchcraft like um like modern day illusionary magic yeah um and i think what i'm trying to say is that historically the distinction had not been made yet between astronomy and astrology and chemistry and uh alchemy the way that we 
divide those things up today so back then those things were all just Mm. considered um science and so like for example the author of the book um believed in the medicinal value of a unicorn's horn Uh, why not if you can find a Uh, unicorn's horn i'm sure it can probably do something good (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, yes um so you know other things like demonic possession that's not witchcraft that's just science that's just fact oh okay yeah that's good so um it's interesting that th- what we would call witchcraft today and what they are calling witchcraft and i think honestly even what we would have considered witchcraft in the salem witch trials like this isn't even necessarily like putting in a hex on somebody um this is more about like street charlatans. Oh my goodness, the persecution of charlatans, <laughs> the poor things. <laughs> <laughs> so what what I also thought was um very interesting to me is is that uh people who used this book. So so this book uh was heavily plagiarized, but in the places it was plagiarized was like I think a book called The Art of Juggling in 1612. So there is there is like you know street tricks that are described very well the descriptions are very vivid in this book and i think that they were plagiarized in and like resold as uh you know more specific topics like juggling um which i thought was really cool but then also um somebody who cared a lot about this book was william shakespeare oh um yeah he specifically studied this book for macbeth yeah like the Tichaba, uh, no, not Tichaba. What was their names? The um... the witches in Macbeth. Yeah, what were their names? They had great names. I never read Macbeth. Hold on, let, let me Google. So it. while you find that, <laughs> <laughs> the um, the really interesting thing that I loved about the author, or at least his process, was that he actually did a lot of research. So this volume was put together as kind of like a literature review of all of the books that had existed on witchcraft. Um, So maybe the distinction that I'm trying to make is witchcraft versus occultism. So this is not necessarily getting into what we would consider occultism, but some of the foundational books on occult philosophy do borrow from this book um, because he did a really exceptional review of everything that had existed at the time. So um, you may have heard of Sir Thomas More, Abraham Fleming. Um, These are some of the authors that he borrowed from. And he also went... I love this. Like, this is when he got, like, a million respect points from me. He had studied superstitions superstitions surrounding witchcraft that were recorded in courts of law out in the country. Oh, wow. That would have been such, like, a fascinating, um, like, review for him going around and reading all these transcripts of of witch convictions. Yeah. So he – exactly. He had gone around and – Especially he had found in rural areas, people were more predisposed in believing in witchcraft. So I don't know if they were just more superstitious or, you know, like really bored. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm not going to leave that out (laughs) because I imagine their lives were really looking for something. Yeah, a little bizarre, a little little something, something, you know. I I would have gone insane. Uh, (laughs) Me too. (laughs) So, um, yeah, he he looked through court documents uh, specific in specifically to like – country in country areas or country districts uh, according to the wikipedia article and um he had said that witchcraft really flourished in areas like that so he wanted to compile everything into a document and then sort of debunk everything that people believed was witchcraft at the time but again like i said remember that his scope for what should be debunked did not include things like alchemy and astrology and things like that did you find the the names yeah yeah they were uh flo vi and rue um were the witches and they're that they're the famous double double toil and trouble like hair of a newt Mm -hmm. leg of a frog um yes yes but yeah they were fabulous that is so cool that shakespeare studied like this work to get the vibes of the witches down pat i, I i'm also interested i don't remember what like oh it was written in english 
Um, but this guy, the author R Reginald Scott, really did his research so far as to incorporate, I think, so according to the article, he enumerates 212 authors that wrote in Latin and 23 authors who wrote in English. Wow. So this is like a PhD thesis, like a, a huge literature review on, <laughs> on the topic. Yes. Yeah, so this is, uh, let's see, 23 plus 12 is 35. So 235 texts that were both in Latin and in English that hmm. he essentially synthesized and translated into this huge wow. book. And like I said, it's available on Project Gutenberg, like f for free, the PDF. And for our hangout today, um, I actually just scrolled through the PDF very quickly to the pictures, laughed at the pictures, and then read the picture descriptions. <laughs> Like you would do with a real thesis. You would scroll to the figures and read the captions. <laughs> of course. So um, without further ado, I would like to teach you some magic tricks. Yes, please. Okay. So the title of... <laughs> what do I want to say? Uh, to eat a knife and to fetch it out of any other place. <laughs> So what you would first do is you would take a knife and you would contain it. That's the words he used. Contain the knife within two of your hands. So what you would do is as if you were holding like a microphone or, um, you know, even like a cup with two hands, you would do that with the knife and with the point facing you. And you would put the knife basically right between your teeth and chomp on it so that you make a noise. Oh, oh. Okay. So you, no, that I've got sensitive teeth. Ooh. You want to trip, but Sarah, you got it. You got to make sacrifices right you now. You got to commit to the Sarah. bit. Sarah, yep, you're, we're commit. We are gonna. We are gonna fetch this out of any place. So you gotta get. You gotta be ready. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> so you bite, bite down on the tip of the knife, and oh, you it. make it seem like you are pantomiming that you are pushing it into your mouth but really both hands are covering the rest of the knife and then because you're trying so hard you go oh my god can some I'm, send for a drink please <laughs> this is so difficult i'm having a very hard time I need some lubrication and when and so, yes this is really it's no it's no easy thing eating a knife so please uh, fetch me some water <laughs> So when somebody goes to fetch you water, you take your hands down. Presumably you're sitting at a table. You bring your hands down. When you bring your hands down, drop the knife in your lap. Wow, this only works under okay. super specific <laughs> circumstances. I'm not done. I'm, we're going to seal the deal right now. I'm not. I'm not done. Oh so then when, this, when the person comes back, you drink the water and you're like, thank you so much. Maybe you like, like lean over and sip. Then you bring your hands back up to your mouth. You know the knife isn't there, but they think the knife is still there. And then as you pull, pull your imaginary knife towards your face again, you bite down on your fingertip. Oh. Or sorry, on your, on your nail. I'm so sorry. You bite down on the edge of your nail and then you pretend to shove it into your mouth. <laughs> you just, with both hands, you bite your nail and you pretend to shove the knife into your mouth and you open... Wait, so... Th th do they think that you're biting it into pieces? No, you are just really struggling to get a really sharp knife in your mouth and you're not enjoying it. Yeah, yeah. So then you pull it down, but then when you come back up, they don't see the knife. Yeah, so you just bring it up quickly and, you know, just... Yeah, it seems seems flawed, but I am i don't think it would fool me. Like, if this is on Penn and Teller, <laughs> I think they would... It would not Sarah, fool Sarah, I probably should have said this first. Absolutely nothing from medieval times is going to fool you. <laughs> if you're looking to be fooled by anything, I, I will also note that I am teaching you how to do the fooling. <laughs> so, so just hearing how the magic trick works and saying that wouldn't fool me. Well, correct. Because... <laughs> No, I'm just saying, just like uh, picturing picturing a person do this. Look, it's um, it, I'm astounded that people thought it was. You real. play D and D. You know that there's a charisma modifier. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. They they had like plus seven to their charisma, didn't they? <laughs> you gotta you gotta really play it up. Like, oh, this is so difficult. You gotta get me water. Oh yeah, I need water. Oh, okay. You gotta, get, you gotta leave the room to get me water. Yeah. <laughs> 
I need water. <laughs> so then, for the piece, piece de resistance, resistance. Yes. You, you then you you like I said. Where do we leave off? You're biting your nail, and then you move. You were holding the knife with both hands, but now at this point, you cup one hand with the other presumably the one that you're not biting the nail and you just pretend to shove the rest into your mouth and you're like oh my god this hurts so much i need another glass of water <laughs> and so- <laughs> stop it so your good friend runs and gets you another glass of water and as they're doing that you take the knife out of your lap <laughs> and then you pretend to pull it out of your ass <laughs> And you're like, oh my god, while you were gone, oh my god. <laughs> while you were gone. <laughs> this is witchcraft. So, <laughs> this is the worst. So what, okay, but here's that's that's the simple version. That's easy mode. <laughs> I would like to read you the sentence describing hard mode. I would like to read it directly. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay, but if you have another knife, another like knife and a confederate, meaning friend, if you have another like knife and a confederate, you may do 20 notable wonders hereby, colon, as to send a stander by into some garden or orchard describing to him some tree or herb under which it is sticketh <laughs> or else some stranger's sheath or pocket etc in other words i will translate you ask your friend to take an identical knife and put it under a tree somewhere and you pretend that you are divining that it is under this tree and you send presumably whoever got you water over to a tree and you're like i swallowed this sword and now it's under that tree <laughs> oh stop this is like uh like the the coin coming out your ear like the oh yes there it is oh my god <laughs> um so another one is to thrust a bodkin through your tongue so a, a bodkin i think is a type of knife Oh, a blunt, thick needle with a large eye. So, okay. So basically something that I guess what would, um, okay. Yeah. So a pin or, or a, um, it's like something between a pin and a knife. It's pretty large. So ahead of time, this is going to take some prep. You would take your bodkin and you would carve out in the middle of it, a small, like three quarters of an inch uh, radius or di- I guess three quarters of an inch diameter uh, little semicircle out of the middle of your bodkin and uh, you would instead place to to cover that that sort of like carved out area you would place like a tiny piece of iron or something that's very flimsy and you would hold your little machination very close to your mouth and very, very quickly, I suppose, um, strike it on your tongue. So you would knock the, ideally, knock the iron piece out with your tongue and simultaneously clasp your uh, little bodkin to your tongue. So your tongue is in that three quarters of an inch semicircle that is cut in the middle of your bodkin. (laughs) And presumably that piece of iron is still somewhere in your mouth, maybe under your tongue. Oh my gosh. That is, again, very complicated. I think it, it suggests that you bite the metal so that it seems like the bodkin is stuck on your tongue. I don't know. But it, but it seems like you have to really pantomime this one to really like pull it off. You have to be like, oh my God, this is stuck on my tongue. Look. And then you show and it's, you know, like the, those like silly hats you can wear that have, that looks like an arrow's p- pierced through your head. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly <laughs> yes, what this, this is. Yeah. Yes. That's what this is. But with your tongue. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Or like the Frankenstein, um, like bolt around your neck. Just, I don't, this is how people got their kicks. Like. <laughs> In in the 1500s. This is witchcraft? <laughs> yeah, this is witchcraft. <laughs> this sucks. People died for this. <laughs> I mean, people died for this. Don't you this know? This sucks. People died for this. <laughs> I'm, gonna, 
I can just imagine you just like entertaining your friend at a bar and he just like witch <laughs> and just like witch. tackles you <laughs> with this bodkin <laughs> from I, your top. I have two I have two more. Yes, please. Um yes, the next please. one's pretty quick, and then the last one is my grand finale in this mental performance. So the title of the next one is To Thrust a Piece of Lead into One Eye and to drive it about with a stick between the skin and the flesh of the forehead until it be brought to the other eye and where it be thrust out. I'd like to ask you right off the bat, what is the least favorite metal you would like to put in your eye? Lead. Lead 100%. Lead. <laughs> yeah. How are you gotta be so lead. ready? How are you guys so ready with that? <laughs> <laughs> so guess what? <laughs> They put lead in their eyes. If you, if you didn't guess from the title, we are putting a piece of lead in our eye. Lead in our eyes. Was it because it was soft? So it, Softer than other metals? I don't know. I don't know if it's because it's soft or if it was somehow more readily available. Probably more readily available. <laughs> what you would do... Jeez. Do not try this at home. It goes without saying. You would put a piece of lead... Under one of the nether lids of your eye. (laughs) And you would pretend to push it under your eyeball. And you would use the end of a juggling stick. But the underside of your juggling stick is hollow. So you, you have the piece of lead basically under your eyelid. And then you pretend to push it into your head really hard with a stick. Mm -hmm. But the trick is that your stick is hollow. So you're actually just putting the lead into the hollow part of the stick. Okay, so (laughs) the gesture is that you take it from, you you keep your um, juggling stick, because I guess that's what they would use, or your hollowed um, prop stick. You keep it held fixed and flush against your face. So you just pantomime that you just oh forced force this piece of metal behind your eye. You're holding the stick up to your head and you just go move the stick from one eye around the top of your forehead and down to the bottom part of the next eye. <laughs> The other eye so if i'm shoving this through my right eye i move the stick flush against my head all the way around my forehead all the way down my left temple back over to my left eye and then i pretend to yank that same piece of metal out of my left <laughs> eye this one made me a little bit sad because i imagine some little kid being like i want to do that and not knowing the oh. trick. This <laughs> seems like one of those... Gouging this, his own eye out. <laughs> this seems like a very dangerous one to trick somebody about. But then hard mode. All of these have hard mode at the end. Hard mode is eat some of the lead. Oh, great. <laughs> great. <laughs> good, good start. Eat some of the lead. Already prepackaged, have the lead in your hollowed out stick and pretend you're taking it out of your eye. Why did you eat it? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, is, is it to show that it went from your mouth to your eye? I, like, I think that's the, the game, right? Yeah, it's like I'm passing this uh, through my they head. They didn't understand exactly, the body. Did. Exactly. Like if we're putting, if we're inserting lead through <laughs> one eye and it's traveling around the forehead and coming through the other <laughs> eye, like that could have only worked like back then <laughs> are you ready for my grand oh, finale yeah. i am ready i'm ready okay so it went from really bad to like i can imagine people getting fooled by the second one because no one had to go out and get a glass of water um so yep yeah, and i'm ready for the grand finale i want to be i want to feel like i could be fooled by this that may be the case i think you may be fooled by this one i have no setup for this i have only the punchline so i am going to make a setup <laughs> okay okay i'm keen so i'm doing magic tricks for you on a stage and uh for some reason this is taking place my stage is a decorated dining hall <laughs> <laughs> so there is a table behind me with okay. a tablecloth and some platters i I don't even know when or how this spectacle would occur, but I want you to imagine that I throw a smoke bomb. (laughs) (laughs) And while you cannot see what I'm doing, 
somebody of exactly my size and proportion comes out and lays on the table and puts their head through a hole in the table (laughs) such that their body is laying on the table, their head is through a hole and you cannot see their head. I simultaneously put my body under the table and stick my head through a hole in the table on the other side and have a platter with a perfect neck size hole in it. (laughs) And so what it appears in aggregate is that my body is laying on the table headless and my head is on a platter. And you may be thinking, well, obviously you wouldn't look dead. So the way that you make yourself look dead for whatever reason, is that you take a little bit of flour and blood and you put it all around my neck and you light brimstone, which is also called sulfur for those who are not familiar with brimstone. (laughs) You put it in a dish of coals. You put the coals in front of my face and I have to take two or three huge gasps of burning sulfur so that my the smoke enters (laughs) according to this description. A little smoke enters my nostrils and mouth, which is not unwholesome. (laughs) I don't know what that means. (laughs) And the head presentile will appear stark dead. (laughs) And if the magician set his countenance accordingly, a little blood be sprinkled on his face, the sight will be the stranger. (laughs) So, So basically, I need to look dead and somehow the act of inhaling just disgusting brimstone will well it might actually make you dead if you inhale too much of it i don't know if it would also maybe like the smoke would color part of my face to look like sickly pale yeah that's kind of what i was thinking like because uh sulfur is like a it burns blue but it's got like a little bit of a um rotten egg smell and appearance so Mm. it would smell really bad but also it's got like a mustardy yellow uh like sickly greenish yellow sort of appearance so i wonder if that on my face would make me look dead and so in in some it would be that you know i'm like oh haha i'm alive smoke screen presumably i have no idea because there's no setup right so i think it's just like you know Hey guys, I'll be right back. Or do you do you set it up and invite people to come over and you're just I, waiting there? That that must be what this is. <laughs> that must be what this is. There's no lead up. I think you just walk in and it's like, there's my body, there's my head. <laughs> and I don't know how this would fool people because presumably back then people were around death a lot. <laughs> so I don't know how such a shitty, like, pretend death would would pull. I don't know. I mean, I guess people fainted easily back then. So maybe it would just make people faint or something. Um, But yeah, you need a lot of props for this one. That's the downside. Yeah. um, If if you're going to do it in, like, a smoke cloud, that cloud's got to last for a while while you're lighting your brimstone, painting your face with blood you know, doing all the jazz. Yeah, I mean, even they acknowledge in their hard mode notes, many rules are to be observed herein as to have the long tablecloth so long and wide that it may almost touch the ground and not to suffer the company to stay too long in place. So I imagine that maybe it's like, hold on, stand right there, don't move, because you don't want them to see also that your partner like lying on the table has their head in a hole. So it's like the audience needs to be at exactly the right (laughs) angle. And apparently it was probably hard to procure a tablecloth that was long enough to reach the floor such that it can hide the people hiding under the table. (laughs) Elaborate, but again, people died for this. (laughs) (laughs) There's, There's so much prep that has to go into that for such a shitty payoff. (laughs) anticlimactic (laughs) (laughs) do you think that any of them would have fooled you i think it would have entertained me but i don't think it would have fooled me (laughs) and someone was angry that this book was published yes because it was giving away the secrets or because it was proving that there was no witchcraft what what were they angry about so the the impression i have 
is is closest to the second thing you said, which is that this is showing that witches don't exist. So by um, killing people or you know, yeah, murdering people on the grounds of of witchcraft and practicing witchcraft, um, it's immoral because it's just murder. There's no justification. There's no such thing as witchcraft. Here's here's debunking all of the things that could be called witchcraft, which again hilarious but if you kill somebody because they have done any of these things then then you are in the wrong because they were not witches they were just practicing illusions and so you shouldn't persecute witches and that whole uh idea was pretty damning to the roman church because the roman church was persecuting witches so it was rebellious to like a church doctrine i guess is is the way you would put it so um how bad's that though it's like we're just gonna turn a blind eye no, no, it's fine. Just keep killing the witches. Like, that's wild. It feels like they should have, you know, read the room and been like, oh, we have done some mistakes. That's not very, that's not really the brand of the Catholic Church, though, is it, to admit mistakes? <laughs> like, I was going to say, I think it comes down to politics, because then you would have to admit that you were wrong. And, and I think that, you know, even just thinking of like the Salem witch trial, like these witches would be put on trial in a sense. And so... If there's like mayors or, or other people whose political uh, position like had anything to do with the way that, that the trials went, you know, it, it would also make them look politically bad. Like you persecuted somebody who was innocent, um, so we don't want you to be mayor or we don't want you to be whatever the hell else they had. I uh, highly recommend um, leafing through this book because in addition to these hilarious magic tricks, there are other things like cannibalism and 666 and what it means and <laughs> like you know actual how to use astrology so something i forgot to mention and maybe a good ending point is that a lot of um ancient grimoires took their roots from this book and a grimoire is basically uh a how-to uh in the the witchcraft occulty world that people still use today people still write grimoires today um so a lot of times it has to do with uh angels or demonology and summoning um, various entities. It could be fairies. It could be uh, maleficent deities. It could be anything. It basically, you know, the art of summoning or the art of doing what we would today call magic. Um, a lot of times, your your cookbook, so to speak, is a grimoire, and a lot of grimoires t use this as their foundational research. So there is a lot of um, very, very interesting history of of witchcraft and magic in here. Anyway, let's go. Even I think we're going no, not further. Are we going further in time? Yeah, for yeah, way further back. That's in time. right. Yeah, let's just let's just turn it up a notch. Yeah, yeah. So we're going in the way way back machine. Um, to ancient Peru and the way I got here was really really basic such a basic bitch this week I uh, potato <laughs> potatoes come from central Peru so I clicked on that and then I was looking around at some of the historic things of Peru and then come across the sacred city of Corral and that was me it was like three or four clicks and I got here um, brilliant but Sometimes I thought it's just meant to be pardon Oh, sorry. I just said it. Sometimes it's meant to be. Yeah. Well, I thought this was awesome because so there was kind of like this line that caught me and it says it's considered to be the oldest city in the Americas and one of the oldest cities in the world and of the new world, um, which I think wow. is just wow. insane that it is this incredibly old city with so much to offer um, educationally wise, but we don't like we're not taught it in western society if that makes sense and it is fairly recent mm -hmm. discovery um but it's along the same lines as kind of like some of the the ancient cities with you know within egypt and india and china um but it, it wasn't really considered that because it was discovered so late in in the world um which I, I think is really, really cool. Um, so what, is, what else is completely remarkable about it is that many of these sites around this sacred city of Corel are what we call pre-ceramic civilizations. So when they start doing archaeological digs, they don't find ceramics. So they don't find pots and bowls and, and leftover bits oh. of pottery, um, which is really, really important to being able to sustain uh a big civilization is food storage and keeping and so mm -hmm. they were like wow this this city and we'll go into 
into more detail later on but it's you know very large they think it held thousands of people how did they store their food um and and i'll i'll get to it later a bit of a <gasps> so we find out you yeah tell yeah us. yeah we find out later which oh, is really yeah. really cool um, Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, of course. Sorry. Um, when was it discovered? So it was kind of discovered in 1905. Some some archaeologists kind of come across upon bits and pieces of the city and were like, eh, it's probably, you know, not that old and literally turned around and went away. Um, and then it was rediscovered again in the 40s. Um, and again, the archaeologists were like, eh probably yeah, n- not too much interesting here we're not gonna excavate um you know we'll mark it on a map but there's not it's not worth putting time money and energy into and then in the very early 90s um this amazing archaeologist called um ruth shady who is a peruvian archaeologist uh she rediscovered it and it not only went to the where it was located but began digging on a very limited budget and she put in her own not only her own time but her own money to invest in being able to excavate parts of it to learn more about its history and i think she had something like maybe eight to twenty peruvian soldiers at any one time that the government had lent her to help you know do the heavy lifting Um, because the city was basically buried under dirt um and for two reasons it was buried under dirt just because of time and it was also it 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 appears that the actual inhabitants tried to hide the city um (gasps) when there was you know the spanish uh invasion basically of of south america and many of these ancient cities um were abandoned uh to try protect them because they were considered very sacred Um, Same with Machu Picchu, why that was um, abandoned so early and why we think it took so long to find because it was deliberately abandoned rather than um, the civilization just died out. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, so she went, she started excavating um, and, you know, it is huge. It's 60 hectares, so massive, massive amount of region to try uncover but what they did uncover was that there were six large pyramid structures and one very large like circular kind of center of the city structure um which was really really cool and so what piqued her interest was the fact that it was it looked and appeared like a very well designed city like there was obviously some urban design put into it and uh, you know a great detail of planning to be able to build these structures where it was so it is a little bit inland of um, both the Andes and the coast so it really is central northern Peru and at this time so she's thinking it's probably a couple thousand years old that was her thought um, was that most of the civilizations either like to exist near the water for seafood Um, and for water irrigation it was easier to exist near the coast or to exist very close to the Andes again for water runoff from the mountains it was very very nice Mm. so she was a bit confused why it was kind of in the middle of these two um, and she thought it could have like a huge cultural significance and she was dead right dead right so she kept digging this (laughs) this mad queen kept digging until she was able to find um organic matter that was able to be carbon dated and so yeah what they found and i'll put photos um photos up for everyone to see they found these woven bags so it was like imagine like a big fishing net woven out of really long grass basically but instead of you know filling them up with fish they filled them up with boulders and they use them as retaining walls for building these very large structures oh wow yeah and so they they uncovered these these structural bags that were still intact all of these years later and they were able to use that for carbon dating um and this is where some drama comes into it so obviously she wasn't she didn't have all the funding in the world she was investing her own time and money into this to prove its cultural significance so she formed a collaboration with two american um archaeologists a husband and wife team based in chicago um oh here we go americans gonna fuck it up here we go yes well so they were able to have access to radiocarbon dating labs which in the very early uh 2000s late 90s really really expensive process 
Um, so with their help, they were able to carbon date these samples to uh, about three to 4,000 BC. <gasps> so minimum 5,000 years oh old. Oh my God. Which is an insane amount of time. Yeah, it's before, around the, around the time of of some of the, the first pyramids um, being built. I was going to say, I bet that that really broke the mold, like, you know, paradigm shifting. It did. So anthropologically, um, if you look at some of the ancient civilizations of the the world, so if we look at like Egypt and, and um, some of like the dynasties in China and, you know, other civilizations that existed many thousands of years ago, they were not independent of each other. So people were migrating to and from uh, Europe and Asia. And there was that trade influence that they would learn off other civilizations. Um, so you, it was it kind of like that sharing of knowledge mm. to be able to learn from, from other civilizations to build your own. These people in Peru, completely isolated, um, like there was, there's no evidence of trading that occurred across the Pacific or the Atlantic, like these, they raised this entire civilization without outside help, which is insane. And this is why it's considered one of the the oldest cities in the world, because they're pretty sure at one time, this would have been the largest city in the world um, with many tens of thousands of people visiting through it. Which I think is just amazing. Um, so before before I get too excited and go into more of the science, some, we'll get back to the drama. Um, so what happened was that the Americans, um, you know, went on to publish some more findings about this city and kind of took credit for its discovery. And they would mention Roof's work, but they wouldn't cite it. They would put it in a footnote. In their papers. Oh my god! Yeah. So for anyone who's listening who who's not in the academic space, um, citations of your work is really important. And um, every time it's cited in a paper, that is attributed to you. So you can see how much impact your work is having. If it is cited in a footnote, that does not count as a citation, especially in the day and age of automatic databases and citations. Um, it's just it doesn't count it's missed so you get less attribution to your hard your hard work um, so it was kind of a b- bit of an fu which is sad and apparently the feud between these three was just insane to the point where they couldn't be at the same conferences with each other it was a point where some of the american associations were worried that peru was not going to let them um, have archaeological dig time in different sites um yeah lot lots of drama wow, lots of drama yeah i mean but well deserved yeah. though like what the hell exactly especially because she spent all of this time and what broke my heart was i was reading her own money yeah so their findings were published in science and um the science journal also has uh like public articles so they distill they distill the scientific papers down for public reading and i was reading the original like public article um from 2001 this morning and it was breaking my heart because they were describing it they only quoted the american mail um and they didn't mention ruth by name she was footnoted down the bottom again um so her name was attributed to it, but they didn't mention that the fact that, you know, the years, like many years that she spent own time, own money, own people trying to, oh to uncover this. Um, yeah, it's definitely, you know, disappointing. That's shameful. That is so shameful. Yeah. So I think now in like the archaeological aspects, I think it's attributed to her like indefinitely like she did she did the hard yak to prove that it was significant because before then people didn't think it was significant and now we know that really it is one of the oldest places in south america and what is amazing about it so i mentioned that it was really really big they didn't seem to have pottery so they were really confused how were they sustaining Mm -hmm. food storage because it's built along this area where there are many many rivers so like I think there's 50 large rivers that kind of um, channel into uh, different areas and it looked like they used them for irrigation. So they, they manually made little river stream beds to, to irrigate large amounts of crops. 
And so they were growing lots of things like squash and pumpkin and cotton and and things like that. And what they stored all of their food in was actually dried squash, which I thought was really, really cool. It's like a little (laughs) Halloween-y. Dried gourds. Yeah, exactly. Little gourd storage. And so they didn't need pottery. They didn't need to invent it because they had decent food storage already. It kept it safe. Um, and so um, I was just going to ask if they like if the article said how they figured that out, how they figured the food storage out. Yeah. Yeah. Like, how did they find out? Um, like, did any of them survive? I, I imagine that would have decomposed yeah. really quickly. Yeah, I think they found some like fossilized or some, you know, preserved remains of these dried out gourd bits, um, which is gotcha. why they were able to determine that that's probably what they used. OK, but yeah, it is such a cool a cool site and so at the beginning remember how i said it was kind of like in between the the coast and the andes and they were a bit confused about Mm. what was happening Mm -hmm. they're pretty sure now that it would have served as kind of like a trade center between the two places because they found evidence of sardines and anchovies in this in the city and that would have only been possible if people were bringing fish back and they're pretty sure that some of the old fishing nets that they have found in more coastal locations um, from, you know, only a couple thousand years ago, uh, but still when the city would have been active, they were using the cotton that was grown <gasps> here to, to and their artists, like their artisanal people to weave and create really, really large fishing nets, really strong fishing nets. And then they were even able to use like the gourds, the dried out gourds as kind of like flotation. Oh my gosh. We weave. Isn't that cool? That's amazing. So much thought. And again, 5,000 years ago. It's really amazing. Yeah. That is genius. And so, um, some, and so the actual civilization, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this, is called the the Norte Chico civilization. Um, So that's the name that they gave um, around the people living around this city and around um, these areas in Peru from that time period, um, from about 3000 BC to. Uh, I think it was about 1800 BC, so a few thousand years they lived there. Um, but yet, yeah, suddenly around, you know, around a couple thousand BC, um, they all of a sudden started to disperse from this center. Um, and they're pretty sure that they they hid the center or they, they purposely abandoned it and moved on to other areas, um, which is really crazy. But I thought I would I would just mention some of my favorite things that they have found. So unlike many other cities that you might find in the ancient world where there's lots of art, lots of pottery art, lots of paintings and mosaics and tile and thing like that, things like that 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 represent the artistic culture, which is very strong in all civilizations. Um, they didn't find that because there wasn't pottery. There was, you know, some carvings, but not a lot. And they, at a time, thought maybe they weren't a very, you know, maybe art didn't play a huge role, um, or maybe the deities or their beliefs they didn't worship through art um, until they found all of these hand carved recorders that were made out of condor and pelican bones. Whoa! Which isn't that really, really cool? Yes. Um, Whoa, yeah. I'll have to try it. I'll find a photo and I'll send it through. I'll also send through a photo of the big flat area. Um, I'll upload... I wish I could know what, what it sounded like. Oh, I know. I wonder if they've played that, for, like played them for scientific reasons. It'd be so right. cool. <laughs> For sci- yes, for science. For science, <laughs> yeah. So they're pretty sure they were a super, like a very musical. That's how they used art in their lives and and probably used it in in worship um but we're not uh, we're not 100 percent sure on what their belief systems were and and things like that because there's just so much that needs to be uncovered and excavated to be able to understand um these people which i think is just really really um really cool um, but yeah, are and they still excavating? Is it still ongoing? So I think so, but not largely. So Ruth Shady, she's trying to get enough funding to build a national museum there, so to be able to house some of the the, the artifacts and the history, and be able to, 
you know, use it as a tourist destination, but raise money from the tourism to, to then invest back into the science of understanding it, which I think would be incredible. Right. And I'd love to go there. I think it'd, it'd be amazing. Um, but yeah, and another, just real quick, another amazing thing that they've found is that they think there's evidence of, uh, Q, how do you say it, Lindsay? You told me at the beginning. Oh, kipu. Kipus. Yes, that's it. Kipu, which is basically like a, a, a knot recording system. So you use your fibers or your grasses and tie knots in specific orders, like to count numbers or to write out, um, like use it as an information keeping system, um, which would have uh, been evidence of that trading society and culture again where where they were you know keeping track of different things via these you know really sophisticated um like kind of bookkeeping systems for back in the day um which i you know they're just amazing it's really really cool and i was so stoked to learn about it because you know it out it outbeats like what we call ancient rome and ancient greece and you know the ancients this really is ancient and amazing it's also like so cool to me because this is ancient math you know like this is like evidence that people were um that first of all that it was transactional so like you know there was this this bartering or like this selling like you were saying like it's kind of this bustling metropolis of trade um but Mm. but also you know kipus were used like you said like for for bookkeeping in a way that's like okay, I own 300 chickens and like this person just bought five. So how many chickens do I have? Or, you know, kind of like a, yeah, yeah. Like just like the, it's like evidence of, of algebra being done. It's really, really cool. It's almost like the, um, you can think of them like an ab- abacus. Is that how you say that word? Yeah. Where you slide, slide the, yeah. the balls along to keep track of things. Um, yeah, really, really cool and really sophisticated that, you know, we don't know if they uh, had like a money system because uh, I don't believe there's been evidence of coins or things like that that have been found. But obviously, before money really was a thing, um, you would trade. You know, there would be items of different value, which you know I think makes makes that sense. is super super cool. I like. I would be so interested to know, you know, what are like the more things that they find. Yeah, me too. I really hope that they build the they they get the funding to build the museum, um, and because yeah, if if once you unearth different things, um, so different either organic material um, is the best for being able to figure out exact dates. And so, what another thing I thought was really fascinating was they they found different bits of organic material. So those leftover grasses or the dried squash or whatever it was, you know, even wood fragments can sometimes been used at certain points um, for different types of carbon levels um, to figure out how old something is. But they they took a heap of samples and the majority of them fell around this, you know, roughly 3000 BC, so about 5000 years old. But then there was also these outlier samples that were from about 900 BC and then I believe a couple hundred uh, CE. So, um, so, uh, thousands of years you know over 1500 a thousand to 1500 years after this site was supposedly abandoned they found evidence that there was um small civilizations living on the outskirts of it so the the native people and the indigenous people of the land must have had this ancestral like ancestral knowledge of this location passed down um enough for them to be able to locate it and live there again for a short period of time before moving on yeah like i wonder if that could also be evidence of because this is huge and like it's massive let me uh, let me send more photos so it is like i wonder just ginormous i wonder if some of that is evidence of the people who were burying it because you were saying that like people buried it on purpose when 
like the um, conquistadors came through. And I would think that burying this would take like a really long time. So it would be interesting to see like if the dates overlap, like these encampments that were a little bit more modern. Maybe it was the people who were burying yeah, the civilization. Oh, that could be really interesting. Um, or if they were even... Um, before before the Spanish had conquested or if it was, you know, other indigenous tribes from around the, the South Americas, you know, trekking further and yeah. further, they could have been hiding, yeah, their sacred places. Yeah, like that's what's so puzzling to me um, is like, why, why did they want to hide it? Or at what point did it become a sacred place? Like, especially because if this is like 5000 BC, then like, a thousand ce way way before the the spanish had arrived on the shores. yeah but it makes me think that even like a civilization that's there in like 1000 common era like to them this would also still be mm. a very ancient place yeah exactly yeah i would love to know more of the history and it's something i guess we won't know until they do full excavations and other other parts as well. So this is just one city of many that existed around this time period. Um, there was, you know, there's, I think there's evidence of 30 to 50 other uh, like areas that are of interest that are around this riverbed system um, where they believe, you know, a lot of their people were living. And yeah, there's just so much that still needs to be excavated to, to understand. Um, but yeah, I think it, it's really interesting. And I think it's beautiful that it is kind of this untouched city. Unlike, you know, the Great Pyramids of Giza, you're literally on the doorstep of a major city wow. now. Thank you for this, Sarah. That I never, I've never heard of this. Oh, you're welcome. I hadn't either. So I'm so glad that we could learn it. And it makes me want to like throw in my astrophysics degree and become an archaeologist. It would be so yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely although i'm pretty sure archaeological digs are always looking for volunteers I, so maybe you could be on a team. yeah i will volunteer as tribute i am a doctor of something please let me dig <laughs> <laughs> please just give me a toothbrush and i will just play with the rocks <laughs> yeah yeah let me play with yeah. the rocks yeah <laughs> although so um a while ago my partner and i were taking a cross country trip to move him to Seattle. And one of the places I made a stop is uh, like a rock quarry where there are known fossils and you just like go dig for fossils and whatever you find, you can keep. Oh my gosh. Um, That's really yeah, cool. So I was, I was super excited and apparently these are pretty common. So you can like look them up. Um, and some of them are even like uh, emerald mines or like other like precious stones. Like you can just go it. But the whole reason they let you just keep whatever you find is because it is very hard to find them. It is like a <laughs> lot of nothing and then like a really, really tiny thing. So I do have a bunch of, I think they're called Brachis, Brachistones, Brachiston. I don't know what, basically just like really, really, really old, like tube sort of looking uh, organisms. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I, I have like a few of those that like after like a few hours of just sifting through nothing <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to you'll have to send us a photo and put one up on twitter so we can see your is that, are they rock is it wood it's in rock yeah and um i have like a few tiny little spiral looking seashells or it, it just looks like seashells it just looks like somebody like pushed a seashell into some clay and it, like it looks super unimpressive but it's probably like the leftover trail of a little organism yeah living its best life I, I mean these are these are millions of years old <laughs> but but it doesn't look impressive at all it looks like i found this on the beach <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah it's also very interesting that especially for fossils i know this isn't quite archaeology but the conditions of the soil to make a fossil and the amount of pressure you need are just so particular that i'm amazed that any fossils exist at all <laughs> um, fossils are actually very yes, hard to we make about this in um another episode i can't remember which one it was or it could be our secret lost episode which the audio got a bit corrupted but it will eventually be be up for patreon um but we talked about this idea that there is probably not probably there is so many organisms and life forms that we will have no idea existed 
because they didn't die and become fossilized in exactly the right circumstances oh which is one of my favorite things i remember that that was in the episode where you talked about something that disappears from the fossil record and reappears that's right yes that is right i don't think that was the lost episode no that wasn't no no I think that was episode number three. Let me find it just in case people want to go back and listen. Because that was really cool. This idea that we really know nothing. Like we we know what we can see and what we can find. uh, And we know enough that we can say we don't know. That's right. Because you found. that makes sense. Lots of lots of knowns and unknowns. (laughs) (laughs) You had some really (laughs) freaky looking stuff in that episode i remember you were sending pictures and i was like get that the fuck it was like poseidon's cup or neptune's goblet some neptune's shit like goblet yeah oh, oh yes. my god neptune neptune's I hated goblet that. oh no <laughs> the walmart no, brand no, no, poseidon's no. cup <laughs> <laughs> episode five episode five episode five yeah that's go funny. back and listen <laughs> I can listen. Oh, it is is really, really cool. Yeah, us humans, we know a bit, but we don't know that much. Doing all right. (laughs) Doing all right. Doing all right. (laughs) Well, that's awesome. Oh, I was just going to say, if you want to see photos from um, all of the things we talked about, please head over to Twitter at GoAskAlicePod, Instagram and Facebook, I think at Go Ask Alice podcast and so is TikTok Go Ask Alice podcast and you can go have a look at all the all the different wild and wonderful things that we find <laughs> and Sarah <laughs> attempting magic tricks <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> maybe possibly well thanks for hanging out with us you guys uh, we always always want to hear what you're up to where you've stumbled upon the internet and what weird rabbit holes you've gone down while in procrastination mode And uh, if you ever end up thinking longer than you thought you would about any of our topics, we want to hear about that too, because it's fun going down these rabbit holes together. So just like Sarah said, follow us on Twitter at GoAskAlicePod. If you have fun listening to the podcast, leave us a review, usually on iTunes. I have no idea how to do that on Spotify, if that's possible. And uh, you can follow us on Spotify. Oh, yeah. That's a thing you can do. Yes, (laughs) that's... Yes, hit that follow button. <laughs> Leave us a five star review. You can. You don't even have to write anything. You can just say, "Hey, Steve." I feel like. <laughs> wait, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just say, "Hey, Steve." Yeah, leave us a "Hey, Steve." <laughs> <laughs> Maybe send Steve a little hug, little for Steve. <laughs> So yeah, give us a follow, give us a comment. I don't really know. Just please add some meaning to our lives. And um, we'll talk to you soon. (laughs) Yeah. We love you, Steve. Bye. Love you. Bye. Bye. Love you, (laughs) Steve. I'm going to steal all the bussy from you.